from the Yule family, and I'm going to pull Mr. Chitley here. Does anyone know where the Yule family is missionaries to? Nepal. Yes, Nepal. Good job. All right, it starts out with a verse, Jeremiah 18, 6. O house of Israel, cannot I do this with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. Jeremiah 18, 6. As we have been seeking God's will in our lives and ministry, I have had to remember this verse often. We try to make permanent plans as well as plans for the coming years, but ultimately, we and our plans are in God's hands, and we want Him to do whatever He wants with us. We have had a rough beginning to our year, as in January our family battled a stomach virus that worked its way to each person and lasted about two weeks. And then two weeks later, we had another round of a similar illness. It was a physically exhausting time of trying to uh, nurse our kids back to health as well as keep ourselves and the house operating. Thankfully, Todd and I were in between languages, language phases at the time. We praised the Lord for good health again. Also in January, we got to visit with the president of our board and his wife as they visited Nepal. It was a sweet time of encouragement and fellowship with them. They spoiled us with some special goodies from the States for us and the kids. The kids have been growing like crazy. Kimber turned one years old in February, and she has been learning all kinds of things, from no to walking up and down the stairs on her own while holding on to the railing. Moriah is finishing up second grade. Ginny is getting ready to lose her first tooth, and Sadie, who is two years old, is such a cute jabber jaws right now and copies a lot of what she hears. This last month, we had the privilege of celebrating our second year of living in Nepal. With this anniversary, we have had the opportunity to look back at where God has led us. We often get bogged down in the details right now since much of our time is taken up with language study. It can sometimes be difficult to spend hours each week studying and not seeming to get anywhere. But when we look at where we have come from, there is visible progress. Rachel and I still attend language school five days a week, three hours a day. The children are also continuing with their Nepal three days a week. This continues to be our focus because we believe that being able to communicate is vital to a long-term ministry. Rachel's ability to speak Nepali is progressing quite quickly. Her previous tutor focused on vocabulary, and now she is learning how to use all these word cor words correctly in conversation. Todd can communicate with people out and about and carry on conversation with folks we have been building relationships with over our time here. Recently, we have had the opportunity to travel outside of the valley for a Bible conference at a like-minded church about 60 miles to the south of Kathmandu. This was not your ordinary road trip. On this trip, we encountered washed out mountain roads, very little pavement, stuck trucks blocking the road for hours, and even a tiger scare. Those 60 miles took us nine hours to reverse. The trip back was substantially better, but still it took six hours. And this is the good traveling season. We thanked God for the safety he gave us. We had a wonderful time at the church and being immersed in a a new environment that took us completely out of any comfort zone, but we enjoyed it. For one of the services, we got to sing a special, Lord, I Need You, with our church family in Nepali during the conference. The services were all in Nepali, and so far, and so for the three days, we got lots of practice in speaking and hearing Nepali. Our current visa expires in May, and we believe that, we'll, we, that we will be able to have the same type of visa this coming year. Soon we will be sending our new prayer cards and family pictures to each address that we have on file, so please look out for that in the mail. Please continue to pray with us about God, about how God wants us to stay here long term. Nepal is a closed country to missions, and with this comes the struggles of obtaining and sometimes also maintaining visas. We are not deterred by this, but we are seeking the Lord's guidance in this matter. Because he lives, the Todd Yule family. And it says some prayer requests here are a new visa application, language study, special wisdom for upcoming decisions, and their praises are progress in Nepali, mostly good health and safety traveling. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.
and and they say, hey, you know, Moses, the law of Moses commands us that s someone like this should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What sayest thou? You see, they'd already dealt with Jesus with the law in the book of John. In, in John chapter 5, and it's where Mr. Masters was this morning if you were in Sunday school, Jesus healed someone on the Sabbath day. And they had a problem with that. They were like, you're not supposed to do this on the Sabbath day. They actually wanted to kill Jesus because he had healed a man on the Sabbath day. And this is not our lesson this morning, but Jesus went back and forth with them and called them out on their own hypocrisy, how they also worked on the Sabbath day and how none of them kept the law. And that's in chapter 5. So here we are again. It's like, you know what? Jesus did something on the Sabbath day. He broke the Sabbath day. But now let's go even, let's find something that's even worse. Let's find the commandment that, I mean, if someone breaks this commandment, it's so wrong. It's so evil. They should be stoned for it. Now, what are you going to say about this, Jesus? What are you going to, you, you broke the Sabbath day. You worked on the Sabbath day. But now what are you going to say about this law? Well, you know the story. Jesus acts like he doesn't even hear them. He, he, he bends down and he starts writing in the ground. And what, what's Jesus say to him? He says, he that is without sin, let them cast the first stone. And, and you've heard that. Everyone's heard that saying before, whether you knew it was from the scripture or not. Hey, don't, don't be casting stones. You know, or the person that lives in the glass house shouldn't throw stones. Well, this is what Jesus is saying to him. Anyone here that's without sin. If you're without sin, then go ahead. You pick up a stone and you throw it at her. You be the one to cast the first stone stone. And what happens? None of them are able to do it. None of them are able to pick up a stone and cast it at this woman. The Bible says that they were convicted by their own conscience. Look at what it says in verse 9. It says, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. No, no one could throw the first stone. No, no one was completely innocent. No one had kept the whole law. And every single one of them were convicted by their own conscience, that God-given conscience that every single one of them had there that day, standing before Jesus and standing before this woman. Listen, self-righteousness brings this woman before Jesus and says, Hey, what are we going to do about her? But self-righteousness doesn't look within. Self-righteousness, when we try to act like we're, we're righteous by our own good deeds and by our own works, self-righteousness always look at, looks at the sin of others, but it doesn't look within ourselves. Jesus is going to call them out on this, and He says, listen, if you're without sin, you, you, without sin, you cast the first stone, and none of them can do it. They're all convicted by their own conscience. Their conscience that was within them would not let them pick up a stone and throw it at this woman because every single one of them knew they had broke the law. None of them could throw a stone. Jesus wasn't going to let them off the hook so easy, though. So many times in, in a situation like that, we would just be happy that, hey, this is appeased. You know, now, now they're not questioning me anymore. And now they're leaving this woman alone. So th that's a good turnout. But Jesus wasn't going to let them alone with that. I do love the end of this portion of Scripture. Listen to what it says in verse 10. It says, when Jesus had lifted himself or lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's an amazing theme in the book of John, that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Listen, Jesus came to save sinners. That's what his purpose was. And here they bring in this woman. Hey, you need to condemn this lady because of the sin that she, and no doubt she had committed the sin. The Bible says she was caught in the very act. But Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. 
And this lady was no different. He has compassion on this lady. He's, I'm not here to condemn her. I'm here to save her. But I also want you to notice in the end of verse 11, he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He didn't, he didn't come to condemn this lady, but he also wanted her to know, listen, it's not okay to just go on and sin. It's not okay just to live your life any way that you want to live. And, and, and that's one of the major uh, things that we deal with today is people, we're, we're not under the law, we're under grace, and therefore we take that liberty uh, that we have because we're not under the law, but under grace, and people feel like that means that we can just live our life any way we want to, but that's not true. Sin is still sin in God's eyes. And he tells this lady, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Well, I want you to drop down to verse 21 now. Jesus isn't going to let them off the hook. They're convicted by their own conscience. Remember that, that they've broken the law. None of them can pick a stone up and throw it at this lady because they're convicted by their own conscience. Now look at verse 21. The Bible says, Then, Jesus, uh, or then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whether I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself, because he saith, Whether I go, ye cannot come. That's an interesting question uh, for them to ask. I mean, I can understand wanting to know the answer to that. But Jesus had just said, Hey, listen, you're going to die in your sins. Uh, you, you're gonna, I'm, I'm going to go my way, but you're going to die in your sins. And their, their, their question wasn't, well, what are we going to do about our sin? Their question was, hey, where is Jesus going? They, even, in, even when Jesus says, you're going to die in your sins, they're not wondering how they're going to deal with their sins. So, and, and then Jesus is going to go on. Look at verse 23. And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Listen, they've already been convicted by their own conscience that they were a sinner. And now Jesus is telling them something. You're going to die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am He, if you don't believe I'm the one, if you don't believe that I'm the one that, I, that Jesus had literally been telling them the whole book of John, who He was, that He came straight from the Father. He's God's own Son. That's why they wanted to stone Him in verse 5, or chapter 5, is because they, He being a man, you know, because He said uh, God was His Father, so they wanted to kill Him. Uh, they wanted to kill him because he had broken the Sabbath. Not only that, but because he said that God was, was his father. Jesus was telling them over and over again exactly who he was. And he was saying, listen, if you don't believe that I am he, you're going to die in your sins. Look at verse 25. Then said they unto him, who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. This wasn't the first time they had asked this question. You almost get the feeling here that Jesus is saying, I've already told you who I am. I've told you over and over who I am, and you won't believe me. They say, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. He didn't try to keep it a secret from them who he was. That's why they wanted to kill him, because he told them who he was. In verse 26, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, but I do always those things that please him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now if we were to stop at this portion of Scripture in John chapter 8, we would all say this is a great chapter. 
I mean, listen to all these people. The Bible says that many people believed on him. That's great, right? And Jesus said, listen, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And then in verse 32, he says, and, he, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's awesome. And that's, I mean, that's, that's what we all preach today. Listen, if you believe the scriptures, if you believe the word of God, then you'll be made free. The son can make you free. And that's what he's saying. And if you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But now listen to the response. Here's where self-righteousness rears up. Jesus had just told them, you're going to die in your sins. Listen, if you don't believe that I am He, you're going to die in your sins. And then He tells them, listen, you're going to know the truth. If you believe on Me, you're going to know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The Bible says in verse 33, They answered Him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Their response to Jesus was, What are you talking about, be made free? We're Abraham's seed. It's almost like they were like, Jesus, don't you know who we are? We're, we're the chosen people. We're, we're, we're the ones that, you know, God has chosen us. We're Abraham's seed, and we've never been in bondage to anyone. They wanted to know, how are you saying that you're going to be made free? We've never been in bondage to anyone. I want you to know something, that self-righteousness will make you blind to your history. How, how in the world could they sit there and with a straight face say to Jesus, we're Abraham's seed and we've never been in bondage to anyone? Let's look back at some of their history. If you look over uh, to Psalms 106, go over to Psalms 106. We won't read the whole uh, chapter of Psalms 106, but in the early portion of the chapter, uh, uh, Psalms 106, Jesus talks about, the, or the Bible is talking about how they were in bondage in Egypt. Listen, this is, this is a huge part of their nation's history is when they were in bondage in Egypt. And here they are telling Jesus, we've never been in bondage to anyone. And here they, it, it, the chapter 106 talks extensively how they were in bondage in Egypt and how God delivered them from the Egyptians. But now look at verse 34. We'll pick up in verse 34. The Bible says, they did not destroy the nations. It's talking about the Israelites. God had given them a command to, listen, you are to destroy these nations. And the Bible says, they did not destroy the nations concerning whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works. And they served their idols. And uh, uh, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils. We were never in bondage to anyone. Here they are sacrificing their sons and their daughters to devils because they didn't obey the word of God. Look at verse 38. The Bible says, And shed innocent blood, even the blood of their own sons and of their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the, was the wrath of the Lord kindled against his people insomuch that he had hoard his own inheritance and he gave them into the hand of the heathen and they that hated them ruled over them we were never in bondage to anyone oh yeah you were yeah because you wouldn't obey the word of the lord listen god gave you over to your enemies those that hated you ruled over you is exactly what he's saying in this passage of scripture the Bible says in verse 42, their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many a times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsels and brought 
uh, low their, uh, and, and, and were brought low for their iniquity. Listen, the book of Psalms, at verse, or chapter 106, it just gives us kind of a little bit of their history. Listen, you were in bondage in Egypt, and I delivered you, and you wouldn't obey my voice, and so you were delivered into the hands of your enemies. Over and over and over again, they were in bondage. Over and over and over again, they had to serve other nations. Listen, if the, if the Israelites were never in bondage, and I wrote down just a, a, a small uh, list here, uh, and, and there's many more, but if they were never in bondage, we would have never known of Moses, Samson, Gideon, David, Nehemiah, Esther, Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael. And Azariah. Those are just a, sh a short list of names we'd have never heard of if they were never in bondage to anyone. Their claim was, how are you, how are you going to make us free? We're Abraham's seed. We're never in bondage to anyone. But throughout their history, they, they had spent more time in bondage and in servitude than they had a free people. They had spent a large portion of their history serving other nations because they, they wouldn't obey God. God's word. They wouldn't, they wouldn't follow the Lord and God would give them over into the hands of their enemies. With all of these examples of bondage in their history, how incredibly blinded by their own self-righteousness would they have to be to make the statement, we're Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. Listen, this was a nation the Israelites prided themselves on their history and knowing their history. This was something, I mean, you were supposed to know what family you were from and what your lineage was and what your family's story was. And there's no way they wouldn't have known what their history was. And here they are looking at Jesus and saying, we were Abraham's seed and we were never in bondage to anyone. I'll tell you here, if you're here this morning and you have that attitude of, hey, listen, I've never been in bondage. I've always been a Christian. You ever witness to someone and they tell you that? Oh, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. Listen, you were, you, either you were in bondage or you are still in bondage to sin. And we're going to look at that later on in this passage. Not only were they blinded by their history, they were also blinded to their current situation. Do you realize when they made this statement to Jesus, hey, we are Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage, that at that time they were under the Roman rule? I mean, they, that's, that's, that's who they were under at this current time when they looked at Jesus and said, we're never in bondage to anyone. At that time, they were under Roman rule. And it wouldn't be long before they would take Jesus to Pilate. And they would cry out, crucify him. And you know what they would say to Pilate? They would say, we have no king but Caesar. We were never in bondage to anyone. And right at that current time, they were under the rule and bondage in Rome. Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 8. I wanted to show this portion of Scripture real quick. But I, th I, I, th I think it goes right along with what we were just talking about. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, and look at verse 4. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. The Bible says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the, uh, 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 but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Listen, the Israelites at this time, they were looking at Samuel. Samuel was a prophet that God had given to Israel to say, I'm, I'm going to tell Samuel what my word is. I'm going to give Samuel my instructions, and you're going to listen to Samuel. Samuel's going to give you my instructions. And now Samuel has gotten older. And the Israel, they're, they're looking at the elders, the, the ones that are in charge in Israel are saying, listen, Samuel, you're old and your children, they don't walk in your ways. 
and what they say, we want you to make us a king like all the other nations. We want you to make us a king to rule over us like all the other nations. At this point, God ruled over them. I mean, their instructions came straight from the Lord. It went from the Lord to the prophet to the people. And that's how it was supposed to be. And now they say, we want a king to rule over us. The Bible says that it displeased Samuel. He, Samuel knew that this was a problem. This isn't right. This isn't what God wants. God, wants, God doesn't need a king to rule over his people. The instructions were supposed to come straight from the Lord. But look at uh, verse 7. The Bible Bible says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but, have, uh, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You know what, Jesus, what God was saying here? Listen, they've not rejected you, Samuel. They don't want me to reign over them anymore. They don't want me to rule over them anymore. They want a king. They want to be just like all the other nations. And so God said, let them have it. They don't want me to reign over them. Then someone else is going to reign over them. And from that point on, throughout their history, that's exactly what happened. They would have an occasional good king, but most of them were evil and would do evil in the sight of the Lord. And they would be under the rule of a wicked, evil king. And if it wasn't a wicked, evil king, they would be under the rule of a wicked, evil nation that would come in and capture them, or that they would just be in servitude to them. If, whether if it was the Assyrians or the Babylonians or whoever, the Philistines, you name it, it just seemed like every single place they went, they were in bondage to somebody. And, and they, they would have the audacity to say, hey, we've never been in bondage to anyone. And because, listen, because they said, we don't want God to rule over us. When they rejected God, it caused them in, in, in the book of John chapter 19 to make the statement, we have no king but Caesar. When they say, we don't want God to reign over us, now Caesar's reigning over them. And whatever king throughout their history it may have been. As bad as all their past bondage had been, this wasn't what Jesus was offering to set them free from. You know, many of the, you know, the disciples and the people that followed Jesus at that time, they were so excited for Jesus because they thought Jesus had come and He was going to set up a kingdom. He thought that they, he, was going to set, he was going to overthrow the Roman rule. And they thought, man, this is great. Jesus is, we're going to make Him our King. We're going to let Him rule over us. But Jesus said, no, my, earth, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. That's not what Jesus had come to do. He had and come to overthrow Rome. He had come to set them free from their sins. The bondage that Jesus was offering to set them free from was not the Romans. It wasn't the Philistines. It wasn't anyone else. The bondage that He was offering to set them free from was the bondage of their own sin. Listen to what it says in verse 34. Go on back over to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 and verse 34. This is after they say, We are Abraham's seed and never been in bondage to anyone. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. This is what Jesus was saying. They were like, hey, we're Abraham's seed. We've never been in bondage to anyone. And Jesus said, oh, you're in bondage. It's not to a nation. It's not to a king. But you're in bondage to your own sin. He that committeth sin is the servant of sin. Jesus said, hey, you are in bondage. You're in bondage to your own sin. If you need a, a great passage on that, and we won't go there this morning, but anytime you want to, go over to Romans chapter 6. And it talks about, hey, listen, if you yield yourself servant to sin, if you yield, that's whose servant you are. To whoever you yield your members to, that's who you serve. Whether of sin un or obedience unto righteousness or sin unto death. If you want to be the servant of sin, you'll be the servant of sin. 
sin. And that's exactly what Jesus is telling them here. You are in bondage. You, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. What a promise from God. What a promise from Jesus here. Listen, the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son does. Jesus was the Son of God. And if the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. There's, th listen, there's no bondage to anyone that's been set free. The bondage of sin that we once had, that we once carried before we were saved. Listen, when Jesus saved you, you were free from that bondage. The, the law of sin and death, there, there's no more now. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Listen, we were made free from that law from the law of sin and death and 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 because the son hath made you free ye shall be free indeed but they weren't done look at verse 37 or, or Jesus wasn't done. He wasn't going to let them off the hook still. He says, I know that you're Abraham's seed but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. Man, Jesus, he just, he calls them out again. He said, I'm from above, you're from beneath. I speak the things which I've heard from my father. And their response again is, hey, Abraham's our father. No, Jesus calls them out. He says, listen, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. And then in verse 40, he says, but now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. They said, uh, then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Now they're getting really bold. Remember what they wanted to kill Jesus for in chapter 5? Because he said that God was his father. He had broken the Sabbath and said, God is my father. And here they are in chapter 8, and they said, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Abraham's our father. And when Jesus says, no, no, you, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the words of Abraham. Abraham didn't seek to kill me. And then they went even further and said, you know what? God's our father. Jesus, Jesus was making the claim that not only God was his father, but he proceeded straight from God. He came straight from God. And that's why they wanted to kill him. But here they are in their own self-righteousness. Hey, we're Abraham's seed. Abraham's our father. God's our father. And Jesus over and over again is pointing out the fact to them, no, you're under bondage, you're in sin, and you need a Savior. Look at verse 42. The Bible says in verse 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are your father the devil. The lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Listen, Jesus said, God's not your father. You claiming that Abraham's your father, and you're claiming that God's your father. He said, you're of your father, the devil. This is an amazing thing in this verse. Jesus had already caught these, th these people in several lies. Jesus had already called them out on their own sin and caught them in several lies. He had already, he had already called them out that you're looking to kill me. You're seeking to kill me. There was one point in chapter 7 where Jesus said, hey, you, you're seeking to kill me. And they would say, hey, you, you have a devil. No one's looking to kill you. And very clearly in chapter 5, the Bible says that they were seeking to kill him. They knew they wanted to kill him. 
And with the, they try to look at Jesus with a straightened face and say, you got a devil. No one's looking to kill you. They were trying to do this in secret. They were trying to hide this fact, but Jesus knew all about it. And look at what he says. You're of your father, the devil. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And he's a murderer. Look at verse 45. I lost my spot there for a second. He said, you're of your father, the devil, the lust of your father you will do in verse 44. And then in verse 45, he says, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if, I tell, and if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Verse 48, the Bible says, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou say, if, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who makest thyself to be? Jesus makes a statement. He says, listen, if anyone keeps my saying, he'll never see death. And now they're like, now we know you're now we know you have a devil. Abraham's dead. All the prophets are dead. And you say if anyone keeps your saying, they'll never see death. Now we know you have a devil. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him, and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Or, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Jesus was saying, Listen, before Abraham was, I am. He was, he was claiming his own deity. I existed before Abraham. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. You're claiming that Abraham is your father. Abraham was looking forward to seeing me. And Abraham saw it. And they say, hey, you're not even 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And now look at verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him. I want you to know that self-righteousness will blind you to your own conscience. What happened in the beginning of this chapter? They brought, a, they brought a woman to Jesus called an adultery in the very act, and they want to stone her. And Jesus says, he that's without sin cast the first stone. And now here we are at the end of the chapter. There's no fault in Jesus. He asked them, which of you convinceth me, which of you can convict me of sin? None of them could. When they brought him to Pilate, Pilate would say, I find no fault in him. There's no sin in him. 
But because of their own self-righteousness, listen, it'll blind you to your own conscience. In the beginning of the chapter, when Jesus said, He that's without sin cast the first stone, they couldn't cast a stone. They couldn't pick up a stone and throw it at this lady because they knew they were all sinners. They knew they had all broken the law. But now in the end of the chapter, when Jesus says, No, you're a sinner. You're under bondage. You need to be set free. Listen, the Son needs to make you free. If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. And when Jesus calls them out, and when Jesus says, no, it's not good enough to be Abraham's children. It's not good enough to be the seed of Abraham. You're under the bondage of sin. Now they're picking up stones to cast at Jesus. Earlier in the chapter, they couldn't do it because of their own conscience, wouldn't let them pick up a stone. But, by, but because of their self-righteousness, but because they wouldn't believe Jesus, and they wouldn't believe the Word of God, now they're picking up stones to throw at Jesus. What a change in their attitude from the beginning of the chapter to the end of the chapter. But that's what self-righteousness will do to you. If you feel like you've, you've attained something by your own works, by your own deeds, if you look at someone else and say, hey, that person's a sinner, but I'm not a sinner. Listen, that's what they were doing. And here it is at the end of the chapter. They're wanting to stone Jesus. I want you to see, turn over to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, this is where self-righteousness will get you in the end. Luke chapter 16, and verse, we'll start in verse 19. The Bible says in verse 19, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by, by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Listen to this in verse 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And I want you to notice what he says in verse 24. He says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham. In John chapter 8, they were like, Hey, Abraham's our father. We are Abraham's seed. This should have this should have sent chills up the any Jewish person there that heard Jesus say tell this story of this rich man that died and in hell he lifted up his eyes and what did he say he said Father Abraham it's not good enough to be Abraham's seed. You need to be made free from your sin. The Son has to make you free from your sin. If you've not been made free from your sin by the Son, then you're still in bondage. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Listen to what Abraham's response was. But Abraham said, Son... He recognizes him as a son. Hey, Father Abraham. Abraham's response to him is son. He was, a, he was of the seed of Abraham, and here he is, and in hell he lifts up his eyes being in torments. This man was never set free from the bondage of sin. He thought because of his own righteousness and because he was of the seed of Abraham, he was going to be okay. But he wasn't. It gives us a strict, a, a, a distinct contrast. I don't know who this man Lazarus was. He doesn't really tell us uh, much, much about his lineage or anything right now. But we know that this rich man was Abraham's seed. We know that he called Abraham his father. And I think this is such an amazing thing, though. What did the Jews say to Jesus? They said, Abraham is dead. And the prophets... How are you saying that anyone that believes you're saying will never taste death? And you go over to this chapter right here in, in, in Luke chapter 16. And the Bible says that this rich man lifts up his eyes. And what does he see? He sees Abraham. He's not dead. What do you know? 
He that believes the Word of God will never taste death. That's exactly what... Yeah, oh yeah, Abraham's body, yeah, his physical body died. He passed away from this earth. But you know what? He lives on. God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He, listen, he that believeth in me shall never die. That's what Jesus was telling them over and over again. I'm offering everlasting life. Anyone that believes me, listen, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And here he is again. Listen, life is offered through him. A Abraham is still alive. He's, he's not dead like the Jews had assumed he was dead. He, he's, Jesus said, if anyone believes my saying, Abraham believed him. The Bible says that Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. Listen, because Abraham believed God, here he is. He's in Abraham's bosom. The rich man sees him afar off. And here's the rich man. He's, he's of the seed of Abraham. But he didn't make it because he didn't believe God. He didn't believe the Word of God. That's where self-righteousness will get you. Look over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Jesus wanted them to know, listen, he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. But if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 the Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Listen, this is what the Bible was all about. This is what Jesus came for, that we could be made the righteousness of God in Him. Oh yeah, I was the servant of sin. I was under the bondage of sin. But God has made Jesus to be sin for me. He, he that knew no sin became sin for me, that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Not my own righteousness. I can't stand in my own righteousness. I have to have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Go over to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 20. If you're here this morning, and you know that you're in sin, you know that you've committed sin, listen, there's no doubt of that. And we're going to see that in this chapter. I want you to know this morning that Jesus can set you free from your sin. And I want you to know if the Son makes you free, you're free indeed. There's no more bondage. When the Son makes you free, the Son abides in the house forever. And you're free indeed. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Jesus wants us to know, listen, the faith that is in Jesus Christ, when we, have, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, listen, it's not the righteousness of the law, but it's the faith of Jesus Christ. Listen, it, it, let's read verse 22 again. It says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know what it's saying here? It doesn't matter if you're the seed of Abraham. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter. He says there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. We're all, we were all born. Remember I talked about listen, the self-righteousness will blind you to your history. You know that we were all born a sinner. Man, death passed upon all, for all have sinned because of Adam's sin. We, we're all under the sin curse. But Jesus says, I know that. But I want you to know that by the faith of Jesus Christ, you can be set free for that. Look at verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, 
to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by the law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Listen, the, the Jewish people that stood before Jesus that day and said, Hey, we're Abraham's seed. And we're justified by the law. We're justified by our own deeds. And we're justified by our own works. Jesus said, No, you're not. If you've committed sin, you're the servant of sin. And they already knew earlier in that passage, they were convicted by their own conscience. They knew that they were a sinner. And if you're here this morning and you're here without Christ, the first thing you need to know is, Yes, you're a sinner. Every single one of us are. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're the seed of Abraham. It doesn't matter if you're Gentile. It doesn't matter. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I'm going to tell you something. You can be justified through faith in Jesus Christ. You can be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. But by faith in Jesus Christ, you can be Turn over to Revelations chapter 3. And I think this passage gives a, a picture of what self-righteousness looks like. Revelations chapter 3 and verse 15. This is God speaking. He says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now listen to verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. You know what? That's exactly what happens when someone tries to approach God on their own deeds, and by their own righteousness. They approach God like, hey, I'm full. I'm rich. I have need of nothing. And it's like Jesus, God just looks at him and said, no, you're poor and you're wretched and you're naked and you're miserable and you need a Savior. Listen, that's what, the, that's what the gospel is all about. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're here this morning and you know you're a sinner, but you know, hey, Jesus died for me. Jesus came to take my sin away, and I want to put my faith and my trust in Him. You can do that today. You can be made free from sin, and when the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Sonia, could you come on up and just play Jesus paid it all? As she comes to play the invitation this morning, listen, if you're under sin, and we all at one point were, like I said earlier, you're either under bondage now, or at some point you were under bondage. I want to let you know that God can make you free this morning. You can be set free from that sin. Let's everyone just bow our head and close our eyes for a minute.